Look, I'm just going to give, I've been asked to just give a short um, presentation about some of the trends happening in the world. So I thought I'd focus a little bit about my trip um, just recently to um, Paris and then to Spain and then to Abu Dhabi. Um, because I think it's sort of kind of um, tapping into some of the deep trends which are happening. And it's going to be kind of once over lightly, lightly but I'm going to try and make it as entertaining as I possibly can as, and as interesting. So guess what? So I organised this, this tour of this plant, um, you know, the first operating baseload solar and storage plant in the world. And um, the only day in the whole two months I was in Europe and it rained all day. It's just fantastic. But I like that photo actually. Um, it's really nice, the, the, um, the thing in the, in the background. And, uh, it was just me and the manager, about the only people there. But um, he took me on a wonderful tour of the place and it was really interesting. Fortunately, the next day the sun came out and we came back and we sat outside the fence with a busload of um, Japanese tourists and another busload of Korean tourists um, who now make this a bit of a, um, a stopover on their tour around Spain. Um, it's truly magnificent. Um, it's been operating uh, for about five years now, since just after Fukushima. Um, it's, um, its record is 35 days non-stop. Um, um, without any gas backup or anything like that. It's record in winter is 12 days non-stop. It's got to 36 days um, a couple of times actually last year as well. And I put that because we've heard all about sort of solar PV and things like this and, and, um, and battery storage, but this is a technology which everyone thought was going to sort of rule the world for a while and it got sidelined by the plunging cost of solar PV. But now it's just starting to come back into... Um, into interest. This one's been going for five years now. They're building a much bigger one. That's 140 metres, that, um, that tower. You can actually see it 80 kilometres away in Cordoba. Um, it's quite amazing. Um, we drove from there back to Seville, caught the train to Madrid, and for about 20 minutes, um, you're going about 30 kilometres away, and you can actually see it in the distance. And I had my nose glued to the, to the window. And my partner was saying, it's just a bloody tower with a light on it. And I'm going, no, 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 no. Look, really, it's, it's the... It's, it's, the, it's the future. Um, so they're building one with 240 metres, about six times bigger, storage seven times bigger um, in um, North Africa at the moment. Um, they're building one in Chile, they're building one almost complete in Spain, and they're also building one in um, South Africa. We hoped, as um, uh, I think it was Lucy who said earlier on this, this today, that um, we should have one in... Um, uh, in Port Augusta in South Australia, um, it might be a bit of a struggle. But the cost of these now coming down, it's now getting down to about $100 a megawatt hour, um, including um, storage and with solar PV. That's the cost of the one in, um, in, uh, in Chile. And the important thing about that was that it's actually cheaper than coal. They had an auction and one of these technologies with a whole bunch of PV wrapped around it, um, as well as these mirrors, um, was cheaper than a coal-fired plant. So. In most of the world is growing economies with growing demands for energy. So they're now making choices based upon cheapest cost. Um, and those are, going to be, um, those are going to be the choices that they make. And I'll get back to that in a minute as well. Um, Paris, that's the moment of celebration. That's me looking really excited. Um, when they finally, after 21 years, I've actually got a bit of apple caught in my tooth. But, um, <laughs> Um, although there's a funny video of actually just continue eating the apple for a bit, but um, <laughs> and then I get excited. Um, look, let's not under in, in, underestimate what Paris achieved. It was 195 countries coming to an agreement um, like it's never been achieved before. There's 150 uh, country leaders there. That's never happened before. Um, I was reasonably optimistic about what they would achieve. They achieved way more than even I thought they would achieve. Um, two degrees, um, much well below two degrees, going to for 1.5 degrees. Um, that's a statement of intent. Sure, all these countries now got to go back and deal with domestic pol policy and politics and in the power of the incumbent interests. But the road has been set. And there's four reasons why this happened. One is that there's no real disagreement about the climate science, despite what you read in most Australian newspapers. Um, 195 countries all on board. Maybe, um, maybe by Saudi Arabia. Two, um, they learned the lessons of uh, Copenhagen and the UN have been working very hard for six years and the French were actually quite brilliant um, in their diplomatic work. They threw the whole of their foreign... Um, uh, office behind it and they basically had this master plan. They knew that everyone had to go home with a party bag that suited their own country um, and they made sure it had to be individual and they knew what had to be offset with one or the other and they basically nailed it. They knew what the baselines were. Thirdly, um, 
And this is the big reason, is that everyone knew they now had the technologies to do it. Six years ago in um, Copenhagen, everything looked expensive, everything looked dif difficult. The cost falls in solar PV in particular and uh, wind energy has just made that whole thing a lot easier. And um, that was the underlying theme of the whole conference, particularly um, all the associated um, meetings and uh, with business and what have you. And the people, the government's understood that capital has already started shifting, hasn't sh shifted completely, but it's starting moving now. We know that more money is invested in renewables than in um, conventional generation, and that's accelerating particularly with the uh, emerging countries. And what ha happens with Paris here is basically a signal to accelerate that, and it was a very important one. Essentially, they're following the capital, but they're also giving it a kick down the road and giving people um, who are making investments, making decisions about 20 and 30 year investments, well, what would you do given the options in front of you? Um, this is my new favorite graph. Um, this, is 90, this is the cost of solar, how far it's come down. Nigel Morris into the industry about here. Um, and it's come right down below here. Here is the inflection point, just down here. And so we just had, um, and that's the growth in, in solar in, in recent years. And that's going to keep on growing exponentially. And that graph is going to keep on going down, probably almost as steep as that, but it won't look as steep as that because, you know, we're now down to 61 cents a, a what? It's probably US. Yeah, but um, we're, we're actually probably lower than that now anyway. Um, um, not just cheap Chinese panels. I think you'll find that's probably um, some of the sun power ones as well, probably be around about that, 61 cents. Well, okay. We'll lift it back up again at the end there if you want. Yeah, yeah. And some people are also talking about bringing it down 10 to 20% a year anyway with their increases in their, um, in, in their, in their efficiency and their um, greater manufacturing capacity. So that just shows. Um, one of the really interesting things about um, Paris and, um, and just looking at the investments happening around the world, in India, you've got the they just, they just had an auction in India, um, a new record low there. So the Indian energy minister says, well, basically, um, solar is cheaper than coal power now, and they're going to be adding a lot of new generation. Sure, they're going to add a lot of coal generation, but a lot less than what people thought. And as the costs come down, then that's going to change. In Chile, as I mentioned before, um, record lows there as well, including with those, with, with those towers. Morocco said it would go where another one of those big towers is being built at the moment, just announced it's going to go 50% to 50 renewables within 10 years. Um, 10 years ago, it imported 99% of its um, fuel needs and most of its um, electricity came from oil and also gas. And for them, it's just a no-brainer. We've seen the same thing in South Africa. We're seeing the same thing just about everywhere, including in the US where... Um, where, where it's changing rapidly. Um, just looking at this graph again, and just to show the shock that this has happened to the, um, we're seeing the oil price shock at the moment going down, not up. And um, one of the reasons is this graph, which you might have seen before. Now, just going back to this graph here, this is, we're just looking at the last seven or eight years here, which is, looks pretty flat, but to the oil industry, this is what it looks like. That's this one coming down here. So at, at Copenhagen, it was probably just near the top of that. That's how far the costs were away from conventional fuels, and that's how far it's come down compared to them um, in the last six or eight years. And they just haven't seen this coming at all. And if you look at the BP um, annual report, they still can't see it coming. They've been at Paris, they've seen all the reports, and they're still saying, oh, fossil fuels are going to be providing two-thirds of the new generation and, and um, five, um, three-fifths of all generation um, in 50 years hence. And you've got, to, you've got to be thinking, you're kidding yourself. Um, um, so it's quite amazing. It's taking them a long time to get around their, their minds around this, but the, um, but, the shift, but the capital, the people controlling the capital are now understanding this, and they're going to be making the decisions. Um, the other interesting thing about Paris, I went and listened to um, Elon Musk. Uh, I've got to say, he's a real nerd. He's, he's, uh, <laughs> he's, um, he's a nerdy sort of guy, but a really interesting nerdy guy. Um, you know, we've heard a bit about the Tesla battery today, um, the fact that he managed to sell. Uh, there's a lovely piece by Stefan who's talking about he sold a billion dollars worth of um, equipment without actually building anything or even a factory or having a product to sell. But what he is doing is he's bringing it, bringing it to the mass market and there's a lot of other people following in behind who've probably got cheaper and who've probably got better panel, um, systems, but um, he's making it popular. He's trying to reduce it to a choice of colours. Um, other people will be um, reducing it to, um, to, more, um, 
to more to more inter more useful um, choices. But we've seen with his Tesla that he can actually produce um, a beautiful machine. And um, over the next couple of years, we're going to see some um, some cheaper models. I think um, this week, as someone mentioned, we had a story saying that both us, both both Tesla and um, General Motors coming up with something um, in the $30,000 range in the US. That takes it to the mass market. And I think someone has also said today that that just brings it down to no-brainer territory for many people. Chinese doing the same, absolutely. Um, so that's one of the international things. Um, we're led by this man at the moment. Um, that's actually a real picture of him. I didn't distort that at all, but that's him talking in Paris. <laughs> it's really funny. Um, Oh, yeah, I don't think he's got apple stuck in his tooth, but he's got something stuck in his brain because when everyone was talking in Paris about the transition and coming up with really visionary stuff about um, where we go from here, he was stuck in the same rhetoric that Tony Abbott was, talking to the domestic in audience, talking to incumbent interests. It was really quite stunning. And um, Pierre, uh, not Pierre, Justin Trudeau got up and talked to, to, talked to the same audience a few minutes later, and I actually wrote a story saying, well, this is the man that he could have been, and he's not. So Trudeau in Canada is actually, um, they've just announced that they're having a North, North American trade agreement between Canada, the US, and Mexico about climate change and clean energy policy. Trudeau is meeting with his, all his state ministers and state premiers this week to nut out a climate strategy for the country. We're not doing anything in here, despite the fact that he's got the world's best minister working for him on the, um, <laughs> on the, uh, on the environment issue. Um, they're just not going anywhere. And so that's kind of like the problems that we're facing in Australia. We do have an enormous uptake of rooftop solar. We're going to have enormous uptake of battery storage. We are, in many ways, the cutting edge of what's happening worldwide because we have the highest electricity prices. We've got fantastic sun. We've got magnificent take-up. We've got, but we're just running into this cliff, this, this, this little cliff of resistance um, that um, Mike has been talking about with the, um, with the, uh, with the incumbent industries, the uh, distributors, the networks, but more particularly the policy makers and the regulators. And I've actually been writing a bit about it this week. Um, you've had three different reports, the Queensland um, Productivity Commission, the, um, the Victorian mob and the Tasmanian mob, and they're all looking at the fair value of solar. And each of them have come up to, come out and said in these very voluminous documents, well, we're buggered if we can find any benefits of um, rooftop solar or battery storage. And you're going, you are kidding me. You're not even trying. But that's the way that the policy has been formulated over the last five or 10 years. All the tariffs, they are calculated. The benefits are studiously and deliberately ignored. They're just not brought into the equation at all. It's all about what it means for the networks, what it means for the incumbents, not what it means for individuals, not what it means for society as a whole not what it means for health and climate and um, other social benefits. So that's very frustrating. Some of the other things that we're going to see within the resistance is um, we have a nuclear um, inquiry coming up on Monday. Now, a lot of these people have just been sort of poo-pooing them. I mean, I don't think nuclear is going to get a... Uh, has a, uh, a snowflake's chance of hell of getting developed in Australia. But what they will do is that they will try to slow the rollout of renewables because it's sort of followed by people who are either incumbents or they're ideologues, and they're the same mob who either don't accept climate science, hate renewables, and basically don't want change from the centralised uh, model that we are moving towards. And most people accept that we are going to this de decentralised mo model. Someone said today, I think it was Stefan, 50% uh, of all energy will be produced locally within a few decades. All the major energy companies accept that. NG, of all people who own Hazelwood, accept, um, have made that prediction as well. The problem with nuclear is that it will actually try and slow it down, which is why the Minerals Council and the Energy Supply Association has now got behind the nuclear bandwagon because they see it as protecting their current interests. They slow down renewables, they keep base load power and centralised power in there as long as they possibly can. So I don't know what they're going to produce on Monday, but I think people have got to be very wary of it. Um, there's lots of reasons why you would talk about nuclear, but their biggest, their biggest fall at the moment is costs. It's just ridiculous, and they keep on pretending that they don't exist, that costs are only a subject of safety factors. Gosh, who'd want that? Um, and um, other things, but um, it's going to be a really interesting one. Um, the alternative to that man is this man. He was also in Paris looking for an audience. He, um, he didn't find one, um, so he just sort of sat there next to the exit. 
Um, we're still there next to the exit. He's actually got a half decent policy, 50% renewables by uh, 2030, um, a bigger cut in emissions. The Greens go even further, 90% renewables by 2030 and a 80% cut in emissions. Um, the Greens can articulate it, but probably won't get voted in as government. This guy, well, he's got Blackie's chance of articulating it because they seem to be fearful of it, but they're not going to get voted in because, um, sadly, it doesn't seem that um, he um, registers with the public. So that's half the issue we've got in Australia. Um, well, there you go. Look, that was actually my quick little tour of the, um, of the, of the policies, which is basically to say that um, things are moving internationally. Um, I think that the general idea that things will move faster than anyone thinks is, 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 is true. In Australia, we had this wonderful opportunity to actually lead the pack. We've seen some fantastic uh, presentations by Beyond Zero Emissions and other NGOs, but also by the likes of Ross Garner, talking about the opportunities that Australia has as a, um, as a renewable economy, but it just doesn't seem to be sinking in with the, um, with the mainstream politicians. Um, in South Australia, we have a state which is talking about going towards 100% renewables or zero net emissions by 2050. That can only mean 100% renewables, um, subject to what comes out of this Royal Commission. But that's going to be a subject to a lot of debate over the next couple of months, the next couple of years, particularly when the coal-fired power generator shuts down. Um, every little blackout is going to be blamed on wind and solar and the unreliability of renewables. It's going to be an interesting debate. Um, but um, there's a lot saying that um, things are going to move quicker than we thought. And for those of you who don't know, um, that's the main website, Renew Economy, uh, which now has about 220,000 visitors each month and um, read by 11,000 people each day on the new who get the newsletter. Um, that's a bit of fun we had about Tony, Ab Tony Turnbull and Malcolm Abbott. We couldn't actually tell the difference between the two of them. And um, as Claire mentioned before, um, there's one step off the grid, um, which is more of our consumer-focused one. And um, we had some stories about Tayagum, I think, and, um, and lots of other people, what people are doing in their own communities, in their own homes, and in their own businesses and um, why Australians hate their energy utilities more than most. So there you go. Thanks very much. And, um, yeah.